Hello, and welcome to the Political Lens Podcast. This is the second episode in a series of episodes where I interview candidates from all around the country. And whether you're watching this live or on a VOD later, you won't want to miss out. Senator Dianne Feinstein of California has finally decided to retire after just over 30 years in the United States Senate. She will be 91 years old when she finally hands over the torch to whoever's elected in 2024. Some prominent Democrats have already gone off to the races for her seat, one being Congressman Adam Schiff of California's 30th District. This has created a bit of gold rush in the district and already 16 candidates, 17 now, have filed to run for the seat, with possibly more soon to follow. Today I am interviewing Maybe A Girl, also known as Maybe Pudlow. She is one of the only uh, trans, non-binary drag queens that is running in the country. That's not her only claim to fame, but it certainly is something that's gotten you a lot of attention. I'm really happy to have you on have, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Adrian. I'm super excited to be here and super excited to have a chat. You ran against Adam Schiff in 2022 uh, and you were a pretty stark contrast from him in a number of ways, uh, specifically in your progressive stances and calling out his uh, faux progressivism, as some, as some have said. He, of course, is now running for Senate, and you're now running against many Democrats who are, for lack of a better word, uh, following in his wake. And how much more stark of a contrast is there between you and your opponents now? Or is it more it, like deja vu? It's a, That's a great question. Um, so there are 17 people running in this race. Mm -hmm. uh, to give a little bit of a, a quick backstory, when I ran in 2022, it was, I was running in the most crowded uh, primary election in the whole state of California. So we had nine people run in 2022. That was the most most crowded primary out of, uh, you know, over 50 districts. And now, given that it's an open seat, we are still about eight months away from the primary election. There's already 17 people in the election. So it's very clear to me that a lot of folks uh, enter this race for a political opportunity. Uh, you know, this is my third time running. I ran in 2020. I came in third place out of eight. So I didn't make it to the general that year. Ran in 2022, came in second, uh, got over 60,000 votes, almost about 30%, which is, you know, it's interesting because a lot of media has described that as a, a landslide loss. But I guarantee you any of the people that are running right now, had they also challenged Adam Schiff, they also would have lost in a landslide. Uh, so it's interesting to me that so many folks have entered the race now that Schiff is exiting the seat. Um, yeah, I there are it as a bit of a gold rush in my last. Episode. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And there's there's definitely some folks that are to the left of Schiff who are running, uh, but I would describe myself as the most progressive candidate that's running in this race. I also hesitate to use the term radical left because I don't think that there's anything radical about wanting healthcare, housing, education, uh, and just quality life for everybody. Economic equity, LGBTQIA rights, racial justice reproductive rights. That's not radical. That is, it's left, but I wouldn't call it radical. But uh, as somebody who doesn't take any sort of um, corporate influence money, you know, we're totally grassroots. Um, you know, I'm differentiated a lot from many of the other candidates, uh, especially some of the candidates who have held other political offices who are now trying to run for Congress. And how would you respond to people who say that you are part of the radical left? Totally. Uh, well, you know, first of all, I think it should be noted that this district overall is pretty progressive. We live in, you know, it's central Los Angeles. It's Southern California. Uh, I don't want to describe this district as a monolith by any means. But if you were to find a district in this nation that has a huge amount of progressive voters, District 30 is one of those districts. Uh, you know, we are Hollywood, West Hollywood, Silver Lake, Echo Park. But then there's also some other areas that perhaps are a little bit more moderate. Um, there is, um, you know, Burbank and Glendale. And so, you know, those districts as well um, are Democratic, but perhaps maybe a little bit closer to the center. And those are the folks that I'm really trying to, to get their votes because we share a lot of the same values and ideals and wants for ourselves, our families, our neighbors, and our community. Um, but to the folks that would describe me as radical left, um, I think that our ideology is so far opposed from one another that 
I don't think there's anything that I could say to actually try to win them over, if you will. Uh, you've also said that you run more of an intersectional humanitarian campaign. And uh, to many lay people, I don't think that they would understand what that means. But uh, one of those issues that you address is housing for all. Uh, what's a plan that you would advocate for to or put forth that would ameliorate California's housing and houselessness crisis? Totally. So, you know, first off, you know, intersectional humanitarianism uh, to be intersectional means that, you know, there's different groups of people that are intersecting with different uh, qualities or faults that we're trying to fix here in this nation. So when we talk about homelessness, that is an intersectional issue because it affects so many different groups of people who also are probably affected by other issues. So, you know, homelessness uh, disproportionately affects Black and Indigenous and people of color. It disproportionately affects uh, queer people. And so that's what makes it an intersectional issue. And here in Southern California, you know, I first of all, let me say, I think there is this idea amongst a lot of people that people experiencing homelessness, there's a lot of mythology surrounding homeless uh, homelessness issues. And a lot of folks think that, oh, well, people who are experiencing homelessness, they are drug addicts and they're experiencing mental health issues, uh, this, that, and the other. Well, again, even that is an intersectional issue because if we actually had universal health care, folks who are experiencing mental health crises could actually seek that sort of help. Uh, for me, issues that I, or, you know, responses in terms of how do we fix this problem, First and foremost, housing. We need housing cures homelessness. Um, what's really unfortunate is that there is actually enough housing in LA County to house our unhoused community. But the fact of the matter is housing is too expensive here. So in many ways, it is a policy issue. And we need to figure out ways to make rent and to make you know housing payments more affordable to the everyday person. Uh, you know, in fact, just the other day, KTLA put out this article saying that if you live in LA and you make less than $70,000, you're low income. Wow. Think about what that means. <laughs> Think about what that means. I mean, people are spending way too much in housing if they're even housed. And so mm -hmm. the issue right now is we need to get people into housing, but we also need to make sure that folks who are housed stay housed. So ways that we can do that, um, you know, A, create more housing. Um, B, another thing that I'm a big proponent of locally, which is not necess necessarily on a federal level, but um, enforcing a vacancy tax. You know, there are so many empty vacant units in Los Angeles. Charge a fee to own a home that you're supposed to be renting, but you're keeping it vacant because you're trying to, you know, charge an exorbitant amount. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a way, but ultimately it's housing. Housing, permanent supportive housing and permanent supportive services are the way that we cure, you know, and alleviate homelessness. So a follow-up to that, um, providing that this tax goes into place, right? Say that you advocate for this, it's something that's passed on maybe a state level. How would you enforce that through the federal government? Um, say, that's a good question. Of course it could um, be. I don't, it, I don't it even know if it- a state level, but could it be on a federal level for California, but not only for California, for other places. Is that something? Totally. That for well? So we're actually, we're looking to see that actually take place and be enforced on a city and county level first here in Los Angeles, because we're sort of the epicenter of where this, this crisis is happening. Um, but I would love to see collaboration between the municipal, the county, the state, and the federal governments in making this a reality. Um, on a federal level, I think, you know, it's working with HUD to make it easier to address the housing crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's over half a million people across the U.S. who are unhoused. Probably the biggest proportion of those people are right here in California, but it's not specifically a California issue. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do think that it's also working at a federal level to create more public housing, um, to create public banks that support public housing, uh, making it easier to receive housing vouchers. You know, there's there's a multi-year wait here for certain housing programs just here in Los Angeles. And if you're somebody experiencing homelessness, if you're somebody struggling to maintain employment or struggling to receive mental health care or uh, health care for addiction services, chances are you're probably not going to be hyper focusing on this, you know, two, three year wait to be able to get into housing. And that's the thing is housing really helps to alleviate a lot of those problems 
underneath itself. But housing is one of those main things. If you don't have housing, it's really hard to focus on any of your other needs. So I think truly it has to be a collaboration between the federal governments, state, county, and municipal governments. You and a number of other candidates in this race are members of the LGBTQ community. That includes Gerard Rantavosian, Sepi Schein, and uh, Alex Balkian, who I interviewed earlier this week. Uh, but he does not consider himself to be part of that community as long as there is a TQ plus part of it. Uh, do you see yourself in contest with any of the candidates for their votes? And how do you respond to members of that community like Alex, who would, quote, like to be divorced from that part of it? So what's uh, really interesting to me is the number of Democrats that are running in this district. And I will tell you, okay, so I disagree overall with this idea of a political duopoly. Um, politics is much more nuanced than this or that, left or right, blue or red. Unfortunately, we are existing in a system where that is the case. And so when you split it into these two parties, you're going to have folks on either side who are still so far apart from each other in terms of ideology. Um, I actually have been in contact with Alex. We actually have a uh, a meeting planned. We're going to be chatting or getting together sometime soon to hear each other out and see each other's points of view. Um, I do think that we are reasonable people in in many regards, but um, but we also are very clearly different in many regards. Uh, so it's interesting that you have two LGBT, well, <laughs> one LGBTQIA plus candidate and then one LGBT or one LGB candidate. <laughs> yeah, you uh, gotta take a few letters out of there. So yeah, exactly. Um, who are both running as Democrats, but their their version of how they foresee the future are totally different. So I'm looking forward to a conversation with him. I don't want to speak too much about um what he has to say before I have that conversation with him. But it is clear just based off of our interactions on social media that we disagree in many regards. Um, and I could go into that actually for a long time, but uh, I don't know how much time we have here. You you can go into it for, I, I would say, if you want to go off for a couple minutes, I'm fine to hear what you have to say. Sure. You know, I don't want to say I'm going off, but no, no. <laughs> I would say, I don't want to no, that's okay. Like that's that. all right. But I would say that, you know, one of the one of the reasons that Alex and I have been in contact with each other as of late is because we have very differing views on what is happening in Glendale with the Glendale Unified School District, mm -hmm. uh, which is also a piece of what is happening, not just in Glendale, but in Los Angeles City, greater L.A. County and the surrounding SoCal area, uh, you know, <clears throat> one of the things I like to talk about a lot is how there has been over half a thousand anti-LGBTQIA bills introduced on state and federal levels all across the United States. It's a really scary time to be a queer person. And I've talked about this in some of the other interviews that I do that, you know, I graduated high school in 2004. I've been out of high school for almost 20 years now. Uh, my recollection of my experience being a queer youth, because I came out as queer when I was a teenager. I was not yet an adult. It didn't, I didn't suddenly realize when I'm 18, oh, I'm a queer person now that I'm an adult. Those are things that you start to experience in your youth. And for me, I recall how lonely of an experience it was because I didn't see any sort of media representation. I didn't really see any greater conversations happening surrounding the LGBTQIA community, which I would not have even been able to have labeled that at that point because I didn't I didn't know anything about it. And so what that did to me and my experience speaking to other people is it made us feel very othered. It made us feel like, oh, I actually, I don't know what resources or what people to turn to to be able to talk about these issues. I was really afraid that my family would disown me, which is the case for a lot of young queer people. You know, 40% of, of unhoused youth are LGBTQIA, and oftentimes that's because they are in families that are not supportive. Mm. They're kicked out or they run away because they are not in a supportive family. So um, so it is really, it's personal to me because even though I'm not an LGBTQIA youth, I was at one time and I remember what it was like. What I can't imagine right now is living in a world where I'm constantly seeing on almost a daily basis that there is a new bill being introduced in some state where I live that is trying to limit 
my my public existence. And so that would be a really terrifying thing for me if I was a, a, a queer youth right now. So anyways, um, going into Glendale, uh, I was reached out to by community members who live in Glendale. Glendale is a city in California. It's in LA County. It's right next door to where I live. It's about two miles from where I live. So when I have folks reaching out to me saying, I'm feeling unsafe as a queer person because there has been an uptick in anti-LGBTQIA rhetoric in my district, of course, I'm going to look into it and respond to that. I think that's what any good representative does, even though I serve on the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council, this is happening right down the street for me. So I've I've actually been a, a little annoyed that so many people have been like, oh, what is what is she, you know, what does she have anything to do with this? Well, this is happening right down the streets. Uh, furthermore, I was reached out to by by parents who have children in the Glendale Unified School District. Some of these parents are queer. Some of these parents have children that are queer. And then some of these parents are just allies who want to see LGBTQIA inclusion in Glendale. Uh, so I attended the Glendale School Board meeting. It was extremely contentious on many different levels. Um, I personally was targeted by some of the opposition groups, they were, you know, claiming that I was organizing this whole thing, that I was asking Antifa and the Revcoms to come, which I don't have any direct connection to those organizations. I put out a call on my social media saying, hey, the Glendale School Board meeting is happening soon. Uh, it's been rumored that the Proud Boys are going to be there to protest it. Let's show up with some pro-LGBTQIA voices. And, you know, I ended up getting over 1,500 hate comments on my social media, and most of them calling me a pedophile, a groomer, um, you know, saying these really awful, un unsubstantiated things mm -hmm. just because I'm a queer person. And um, what's really interesting is that the Glendale School Board, they weren't even voting on anything that was what I would consider to be controversial. They were voting to recognize June as Pride Month, which is about as mild as it gets, in my opinion. I mean, it's already recognized on a city, county, state, federal level right. for the school district to recognize, you know, it's it's not that big of a deal. And you're hearing a lot of these, these accusations and myths about what's being taught in schools. And the fact of the matter is that the curriculum in the Glendale School Board the it, it hasn't changed in many, many years. What has changed is the uptick in anti-LGBTQIA rhetoric. So why wasn't this happening three years ago when we have the same curriculum going? It just feels like there is this, this, this you know, anti-LGBTQIA sentiment that's coming from kind of all over the U.S. And it's starting to make its way into Southern California. And that's really scary for people like me and my queer neighbors. Sure. Do you so it seems to me that a lot of this is coming out of um, a revived movement, uh, mostly on the conservative side of things. It's not all conservatives. It's not all Republicans. But mm -hmm. this movement has, yes, introduced a lot of anti-trans, anti-non-binary, all sorts of things into the mainstream political spheres. Do you, as a trans person, as a drag queen, as someone who has a personal connection to in opposition to these bills, do you feel like not only do you have a moral obligation to speak out, do you also have a personal obligation to? Yeah, absolutely. Both, both. <clears throat> and I apologize. I'm losing my voice a little bit. I did a, oh. a pride panel earlier today. So I've been speaking all day, uh, but yeah, I absolutely feel it on both uh, a personal level and a political level. Um, you know, when I ran for my local seat and as I've been running for higher office, I've been very clear about my pro unapologetic uh, LGBTQIA positions. Um, again, that doesn't mean that's the only thing that is on my platform, but as a queer person, I'm going to pay particular attention when I see what I consider to be injustices. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about this a lot. And um, it's, it's weird because I feel like I kind of got sucked into it. And now I'm being um, targeted and uh, it's a, it's a sad position to me. And like, I mean, I know I, I put myself out there, but at the same time, you know, it's not I mean, fun. <laughs> how different is a politician from a drag queen? <laughs> In a sense, you're putting yourself <laughs> out there, you're, you're performing, you're making sure everybody hears what you got to say. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a great question. I, uh, <laughs> I feel like uh, as somebody who has intertwined dragon politics, for me, it's hard to differentiate, but uh, 
you know, I don't think that I should be penalized just for putting myself out there as a queer person. And, you know, I haven't experienced it as much in my third run, um, but in, especially in my first run and moving into my second run, uh, you know, folks would sort of question why I was running. Oh, like it, it almost seemed like a joke to them that a drag queen or a trans person would run. Um, but then I ask why, and they struggle to put it into words without coming off extremely homophobic and transphobic, right. you know? So um, it is a peculiar position to be in, but um, it's a position that uh, I feel honored and privileged to be in. And I, I don't take it lightly and I don't take it for granted. Speaking of divergent ideologies, uh, Republicans would probably paint your positions as a progressive as the mainstream of the Democratic Party. Do you agree with that? <clears throat> I don't agree with it at all, actually. It's interesting because um, I wish that my positions were the positions of the mainstream Democratic Party, but they are not. Um, unfortunately, you know, and I've said this many times, I, um, I consider myself to be a progressive Democrat, but if I could successfully run and win as an independent, I would prefer to do that because I'm sick and tired of the duopoly and I'm sick and tired of the only bipartisan elements of the duopoly coming, you know, to issues that are awful, um, that are, you know, war oriented, that are, um, you know, corporate oriented. And that's a, a big bother for me. I think that both the Republican and the Democratic parties are too focused on their corporate donors and not focused enough on the actual people, on voters. Um, so that's where I think that I really differentiate from the party as a whole. Um, you know, I've I've voted as a Democrat for years and years. I've been running as a Democrat, but I think that my, my stance is are a little bit to the left and a little bit more progressive because they are not attached to corporate entities. Um, I am very unapologetically pro-universal health care. Why can we not get Democrats to bring universal health care to the floor? I'm very pro-housing for all, education for all. And um, it's interesting to me because I feel like the times that, that the Democratic Party comes out and says things is when they can't actually do things. You know, I'm really disappointed that Roe v. Wade was not codified years ago. And suddenly it's this big fundraising issue. And it's become very clear to me that there is a business in both the DNC and the RNC where they want to raise as much money as they can to outpower the other side, when in many regards they are doing the same thing as the other side. So um, I think that's a big thing that differentiates me from the mainstream Democratic Party. It's it's actually fascinating to me that that people call Joe Biden a socialist. I wish that he was. <laughs> so being on the left side of the Democrats, not so much far left as some would characterize, but being on the left of the Democrats, um, you would you venture to say that you're the most progressive or the most left out of the candidates that are currently running? I would easily, yes. Who would you say is probably the closest to say Alex Belkian or um, any of the other two Republicans that are running. It's funny because uh, Alex is running as a Democrat, but it's interesting because his no party preference. Oh, no party preference. Yes. Excuse me. Pardon no me. Um, but uh, I think that he's much closer to. Yeah, that's what's interesting about running as an independent. Well, are you a you know are you a leftist independent or you know a more conservative independent? Right. And that's. I think people just see independent, they think, oh, great, they're not a part of the duopoly, but you have to do a little bit more, more digging than that. Um, but of the, the Democrats that are running, the ones that I would say are closest to the center or right would be, uh, you know, Portantino, would be Mike Fuhrer, Ben Savage, absolutely. Um Josh Bocanegra, I think a lot of them are, you know, varying a little bit more towards the center slash right ideologies. Um, the two candidates that I see as having more progressive views are Laura Friedman and Seppi Schein. Um, but I also still think that they could be more progressive in certain ways. I also want to throw this out there that when I started running in 2019 for 2020, I've always set out to not run a smear campaign. So I don't want to talk illy about 
you know, the other folks that are running. My goal has always been to put out my policies, my points of view, my stances. And if you like what you hear, vote for me without having to run a smear campaign on anybody else. Because I do think that there is redeemable qualities about a lot of these candidates. Um, you know, even Laura Friedman, um, you know, I didn't run it. I didn't run for state assembly a few years ago because I was mostly satisfied with my representation when she was my representative. Okay. Um, so that's that's kind of where I stand on that. But uh, I, I do think that I'm the most left. But again, without using the term radical left. No, I, I don't uh, personally, I don't hear any kind of smearing on your part. Uh, I think it's entirely honest to uh, call it like you see it without acting like it's some kind of derogatory term to say somebody's closer to the center. I'm sure that they would probably <laughs> describe themselves that way. But um, your claim to fame is the first drag queen elected to pub public office. Uh, that was as the Silver Lake County Chair, or you were um... Silver Lake Silver Lake Neighborhood Council person, which is a part of the LA municipal government. So I'm part of LA city government. And uh, so you're also going to be on Marion Williamson's stream tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, are you excited? Is it safe to say as well that you're uh, supporting her for president? I am very excited, and yes, I am supporting Marianne. Uh, I think Marianne, Mary and I actually have a uh, a lot of similarities just in terms of the kinds of candidates that we are. Um, you know, I became aware of Marianne Williamson during the 2020 campaign, and it was actually right when she had, um, when she was beginning to drop out and support Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. And um I actually, I met her when she came and did a, a Bernie speech here back in 2020. And it was funny because when I met her, she said, oh, I feel like I've met you before. We met. And I was like, no, we haven't met. I was so excited to meet her. And then we ended up meeting um, at a conference several months later. And then we finally got to communicate and, you know, talk about our political values and ide ideologies. And she endorsed my 2022 campaign. One of the things that I love about Marianne Williamson is people will call her a grifter but she spent very so much time during 2022 and 2021 trying to elect progressive candidates all across the nation without any sort of expectation without any sort of anything in return she basically we had a um, a group called the candidate summit and she and a few other people vetted progressive Democrats and independents running all across the United States. And we met monthly to just sort of be sort of a support group for one another and to talk about current affairs and issues and things that we're talking about in our campaigns. And it was a, a, an amazing way to bring together so many progressive candidates and also to fundraise for all of our grassroots campaigns. And I was so just grateful for it because, you know, she, she did that without expecting anything in return. And so when I found out that she was running for president again against an incumbent, it made me think about my my run against Adam Schiff and how much criticism I received running against an incumbent within my own party. Um, this is something I received all throughout the 2020 campaign, all throughout the 2022 campaign. And it got ugly sometimes. You know, I would have people say, you know, the equivalent of how dare you? How dare you? And you know, it just kind of makes you take a step back. And I think that it is the most democratic thing to challenge your own party and challenge the establishment when you feel like you're you're not being represented and you feel like your neighbors aren't being represented and you feel like the values that you want to see in politics are not being rep represented there. So um, I know that a lot of people also are kind of looking at Marianne in the same sort of how dare you kind of way. But I'm not satisfied with with um, the Biden administration. I think that it's it's a it's a lot of the you know it's more of the the status quo. It's the same old same old. And you know, Marianne said something along the lines of, "How can you expect the people who have driven us into a ditch to get us out of the ditch?" And um, you know, that really that really struck a chord with me. And I, I like what she has to say. Do we agree on every single thing? No, absolutely not. I feel like it would be difficult to find any political uh, candidate or person in office who I agree with on 100% of the issues. But when you're looking at a candidate, you want to look at 
do we have similar core values? Do we have similar values in our, our platform and what we envision in terms of, of, of the future and for our government and for our neighbors? So yes, I am supporting Marianne Williamson. I'm really grateful for the platform that she's given me and so many other progressives. All right, so we have an official endorsement for Marianne Williamson. I'm sure you've already said that publicly, but yes, just I have. Uh, wanted, I like to confirm, I guess. Um, so we have about five and a half minutes. I do have a few more questions that I would like to ask. So I, I wanna get through a couple of those, but um, if you're willing to, come on for like about 10 more minutes uh, mm -hmm. after I ask those, after we run out of time, because thank you, Zoom. Um, <laughs> then, I get it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would just like to talk about like uh, your campaign logo specifically at that point, because um, the way this all started and like trying to get um, people on to talk, especially candidates, was that I posted. To I saw the D. I saw the D you gave me. Yes. <laughs> And, and I'd uh, love to chat about I will, it. <laughs> I won't apologize, but okay. I will um, clarify a few things. And because sure. there's only so much you can say in what I, I only have 140 characters, I think. So, of course. Um, but first, I want to get to your campaign, specifically your campaign strategy. You've been on the Young Turks, the Habituation Room with Francesca Fiorentini, and now my show, uh, the fastest growing political channel on YouTube. Don't fact check that. <laughs> Is the plan to take over social media? And uh, because you compared to your opponents, I'm seeing you everywhere right now. Well, you know, I wouldn't say that's the plan, but if that is what happens, I will gladly take it. You know, something that I've discovered running for, you know, going on five years now is that you have to take every opportunity you can when somebody wants to talk to you about the position that you're running for. Um, I'm not a you know, afraid to take the smallest or the largest opportunity to get to connect with with folks who perhaps would consider voting or donating to our campaign. So, um, yeah, I think social media is really important. I think one would be a fool to consider otherwise. I mean, this has been apparent since Obama was elected. Um, I think that was one of the first big elections where we saw the rise of social media in terms of affecting uh, voters and voter outreach and it's only increased ever since. Um, so yeah, I have a big social media presence. Uh, my social media presence is a combination of my drag and my politics. But again, as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of hard to separate them at this point. And, you know, we've gained um, following over the past several years as we've been running. That goes for not just social media, but also, you know, the number of votes that we've been receiving. So I think that it's natural that we would you know, start to develop a big social media presence. Um, I do think that our campaign is also unique, you know, for obvious reasons as a, a drag performer and as a trans person, um, it's, you know, unusual and I'd like to make it more usual. Um, so I think that my perspective is very unique and um, whether or not you disagree with me, I'm sure that you'd be interested in what I have to say about things. So I hope to see our social media presence continue to grow. Um, and it's a great outlet to be able to communicate with people. So uh, like I said to everybody who's viewing this right now, this is uh, Maybe's campaign logo up on the screen. Uh, maybe I'm sure you don't need to know what it looks like. You've seen it hundreds, <laughs> thousands of times at this point, I'm sure. Uh, I just wanted to, again, I'm not going to apologize for the D ranking that I gave you, but um, I did, I was saying on the stream a minute ago that after further introspection, I think I understand what you were trying to do with the logo, um, but I wanna hear it from you first to uh, know like what your thought process behind the design was and just hear more about like your campaign style um, in terms of the design. What What is it you're going for in this 2024 sure. race? So um, I actually, I wanted to play off a little bit on our 2022 colors. Um, so 2022, our official colors were mint and lavender. And those are definitely a part of our color scheme this time around. But this time around, I just wanted it to be generally purple and green, but really any variations of that. Um, we did go bright on our logo and often some of our imagery that we use, but I wanted it to stand out. Um, you know, I think I get kind of bored when I look at 
political logos, even if they are very, very <laughs> nicely stylized, it's just a lot of red, white, and blue, and um, a yes. little more red. I know where, where where you're leaning. A little more blue. I know where you're leaning. Um, but I wanted to do something a little bit altogether out of the ordinary, um, just because I think that my style of leadership is out of the ordinary. I think me as a candidate, I'm out of the ordinary. And, uh, you know, the significance of the colors themselves, you know, purple, purple's frankly always been my favorite color, and I consider it to be a very, very queer color. And then green, um, just for, you know, environmental reasons. Um, I wanted to show that even though I'm not a Green Party candidate, uh, green issues are still very much a part of uh, our, our platform. So, and then, you know, with like the numbers, I thought that was kind of fun. Honestly, I will tell you, it was my idea. I had somebody else design it, but <laughs> I thought, you know, maybe for Congress and then let's use the four in 2024, let's use the zero in CA30 and just sort of create this little um, little crossword puzzle, if you will. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was saying is after further introspection and looking at it a few more times, I was like, OK, I, I see what they were going for. I'm not so sure that it works on a visual level, only because the colors um, you're using three main colors, the green, that purple, and then sort of a lighter pink, almost a almost a magenta and lilac, lilac. There we go. <laughs> I like that. Um, and. Those are two secondary colors that are I feel like are kind of like competing with each other. So the 2024 and the CA30 across gets a little bit lost in the overall presentation. And this isn't me trying to say like, you need to change it right now, but it definitely, and, and that's another thing I wanted to say is that it definitely catches your eye. That's undeniable. So I, I don't want to take that away from it. Uh, gaudy, yes, but again, you are well versed in drag, and I'm sure that's almost exactly what you were going for. Eye catching, out of the ordinary. Yes, I look through campaign logos like every day or so, and there's a lot of red, white, and blue with not a totally. whole lot in between. I, I appreciate your critiques, and they are well received. Um, I will say our our logo last year and even the year before, we got critiqued as it looking a little too AOC, if you will, just oh. sort of the... Uh, I did not see your campaign logo for 2022. You might be able to look it up on Google. It's uh, it's mint, lavender, and white, and it either says maybe for Congress or maybe 2022, oh. but it's like sort of that upward mm -hmm. slant, which I really like. I do really like, and I do like the connection of, oh, maybe they'll think of AOC. AOC is progressive. But at the same time, I kind of just wanted us to like stand alone this time. The other thing is we use our logo on a few different things, but we've also never shied away from um, using variations of logos and using even variations of color schemes. Like for instance, my my yard signs that we've used, especially last year, they were great. And uh, again, our, our color scheme last year was mint and lavender, but our yard signs were bright blue and bright yellow. Okay. And they, it just, it stood out. And so, especially when you're trying to make something that's eye catching, like somebody driving by or walking by on the street, you know, you don't want it to like blend into the scenery or blend in with every other thing you're looking at. You want something that's going to sort of catch your, you know, the, the corner of your eye. Um, so that's kind of like how I feel about that. I mean, we've definitely thought about perhaps, you know, maybe doing some modifications, but again, we have a couple of different versions and a couple of different ways that we're presenting our imagery. Sure. And I think it's all a little bit connected. It's mostly green and purple, but honestly, I think that we also have a really catchy, like my name I think is very distinct. That's why I am just campaigning off of my first name. You know, I don't know of any other maybes that are running for Congress. Right. And it's also just kind of an easier way to be remembered in my opinion. I, I don't actually, I, I don't hate your 2022 one. Um, it is a little reminiscent of some like 2016 to 2020 candidates, especially on the Democratic side that were running um, like Joaquin Castro and um, AOC was one of them. But I I don't hate it. Uh, I do think that, yeah, you, you made a better call by making the colors a little more saturated, a little like pop more. So... Um, 
I, I don't I don't think that this one is necessarily bad. Again, I want to very I want to clarify that this is purely aesthetic, and this is no, also it's totally fine. I'm not offended. In fact, I was like I actually had this moment when you reached out to uh, do the interview, and I was like, he wants to interview me, and he gave me a D. <laughs> but then I was like, ah, uh, whatever. We all have our different tastes and opinions. Like, I'm really not offended. I was like. <laughs> I may have already messed this up. <laughs> so, <laughs> I did have that moment where where I thought, you know, either she'll be she'll be cool with it. But that's the and... thing is, you know, I also I have to be comfortable speaking with people that don't agree with me on everything, even if it comes down to graphics, you know. Right. So I don't want to agree just to interviews of people who believe in everything that I say in my entire platform and even again down to my graphics. So sure. I'm totally cool talking about this because I like it. But I also hear where you're coming from. I appreciate that. And um, <laughs> I also appreciate you, def like, for sure, coming on in spite of my criticism. <laughs> that, uh, there are a few people who have decidedly not wanted to. Now, whether that is because well, of the I saw logo. you were you were harsh in your critiques. I mean, I don't blame you for that. But I did see a lot of, of low ratings. Did anybody get an A? Uh, <laughs> uh, Alex did. <laughs> I know. Okay. So, um, <laughs> yes, Alex uh, Balakian got an A because I liked how simple and effective it was. The cir Yes, the circular shape for the O in 30 definitely helped with that. Um, there were some that rode the line. I don't like to do like B minus or B plus or anything like that, but there were definitely some that rode the line. Um, I don't, I try to be very uh, selective with who I give A's. And there have only there in in the whole time that I've been doing this, there's only been one S. So S S. Yeah, have you ever seen like those tier maker videos? It's like A through F, and then there's S rank, which is like super. It's above. It's like an A plus plus. Oh, okay. I thought it was like below F. <laughs> and and yeah, below F, like your logo is so I bad. I was like, wow, it was that bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some bad ones too, but um, for anybody out there that likes what maybe has to say, maybe wants to vote or uh, send money her way, where can they find you either on social media or, or your website? Sure. So our website is maybe a girl for congress.org. It's spelled M A E B E A G I R L F O R congress.org. Or you can find me on Instagram. That's kind of where I hang out the most as a millennial. Uh, it's at maybe a girl, M A E B E A G I R L. I'm also on Twitter, which has been a little disappointing lately ever since Elon's taken over, but you will find me there, maybe underscore a underscore girl. And I'm finally getting involved on uh, TikTok. I had to think about it for a second, like TikTok. <laughs> oh. But uh, yeah, you can find us on all social media platforms. And I'd love to connect. If you have questions, please reach out. And again, we are looking for donations. You know, we've got the end of the quarter coming up at the end of this week. And I, I do want to also mention that even though we have fallen behind some of the other candidates that are running for the seats, we actually have just about as many donors. And so my donors might only be spending five, 10, 15, 20, $50. Whereas some of the folks who have brought in many times more money than I have are relying on their rich and wealthy friends and donors who are maxing out on their donations. So it looks like a lot and it is. Um, and unfortunately I wish that we didn't have to raise money to campaign, but we have to get the message out. We need help with, you know, um, the word out on social media, billboards, TV, you know, all the different channels. So I hope you will support us. Maybe I just wanted to say thank you again for coming on. I appreciate you taking my criticism with grace and dignity. Um, again, th since this is kind of the second part of saying goodbye, but uh, also wanted to thank you. Um, what else can people do to support you in your campaign if they choose to? Yeah, I think that, you know, I think folks don't realize how much everybody can do a little bit, you know. Uh, one person running a campaign is practically impossible. Even with a few people, it's hard. But if everybody who supported our campaign shared our tweets, reposted our things on Instagram, uh, I know that not everybody can afford to donate. And, you know, that's part of the issue when you are running to represent working class people. Of course, the people that are going to support you might not be able to max out on donations, but 
a five dollar donation from somebody who is kind of struggling means a whole lot more to me than five hundred dollars from you know the lawyer in west hollywood who's <laughs> donation we still we absolutely appreciate but i think it just has a, a different kind of value and i think it really represents what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a lot of small donors and a lot of a lot of people to support our campaign because we're here for the little people and to add on to that yes i i understand there are always people that are going to be working not just the people going and pounding the street and uh, knocking on doors but also your logo designer and Whoever that was, I apologize if I hurt your feelings. I was not trying to. <laughs> but he will not be seeing this. I am not sharing this uh, podcast with him. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, I guess that's just one less person. But I but... might take it back quietly. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe. Thanks again for coming on. I really, really appreciate your time. And best of luck going forward. Uh, if anybody has any questions that they want to push to me, if you'd be willing to another to do another interview later on in the future as the campaign rolls on, I would also appreciate that. No pressure, but it would be great yeah, to circle absolutely. back. Yeah, absolutely. Hit me this. up closer to the primary. I'll definitely do another interview. I'm also so curious to see who, uh, who accepts and who declines this interview because I think it says a lot about some of these candidates who think they are just uh, too good for everybody. That's fair. That's fair. I, I I won't make the claim that that's why they're doing it. I, I'm sure they're busy people. But <laughs> no, but like, I mean, that's the thing is that uh, uh, not getting into it. Interview is over, but I can't wait to see who uh, who else has done this show. <laughs> and hopefully there will be many. So uh, I think there will be. I think there will be. Do you have anybody else scheduled? Uh, I did talk to Josh Bocanegra. Um, he is unavailable until August, unfortunately. So we'll we'll just have to wait until then. But um, there are a few that I've reached out to. We'll see how it goes. And in the meantime, if uh, you want to catch those, anybody watching this either live or later on a VOD or on YouTube, please subscribe. I hope you enjoyed this. I And also go and find maybe on social media. They can use all the help they can get. And I'm sure they wouldn't uh, mind having anybody come and subscribe and retweet all of their stuff. So um, to round this off, uh, maybe once again, thanks so much for coming on. I will hit you up later on in the primary. And uh, to everybody else out there, have a great rest of your Tuesday, great rest of your week, and we will see you next time. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you for watching. If you like this and you want to see more like it in the future, please consider subscribing and maybe even hitting that little bell in the corner to notify when new videos go up. And while you're at it, like and share it as well. Political Ends is the fastest growing political content on YouTube. Don't fact check that. So you'll be happy that you did. As always, we'll see you next time.